Oh, they're not, because sweetness, they're trying to get me to lose arms. They've been really mean. Really mean. More than normal, but not more than when they are mean. I view from all these questions Satan is. I find me a friend, I find me a friend. This news is so dull. Oh. 
Structural equipment we've used, including artificial intelligence tools, from thermoscanners to the latest generation control room, are part of a pilot test that can be replicated in all stadiums nationwide. Several events have been planned throughout the capital that is gearing up for Friday. In Piazza del Popolo, inside what has been described as Europe's largest fan zone, two maxi screens will allow football lovers to watch matches. After a year-long wait and despite COVID restrictions, excitement is in the air, with everyone longing to see the city buzzing again. Giorgio Orlandi, for you and... The headline reads, thermal scanners and artificial intelligence in place for opening of Rome games. The US and UK have condemned the verdict, while the European Union says it's Russia's most serious effort to date to suppress independent political opposition. Hermione G has a story. A Russian court has outlawed opposition politician Alexei Navalny's nationwide political organization on the grounds that it's extremist. The ruling, effective immediately, prevents people associated with Navalny's Foundation for Fighting Corruption from seeking public office. Many of Navalny's allies had hoped to run for parliamentary seats in the September election. <coughs> the extremism label also carries lengthy prison terms for activists who have worked for the organizations and anyone who's donated to them. Before the ruling lawyer Ivan Pavlov anticipated the outcome. The authorities believe that the desire of ordinary people for a change in government is extremist by nature. The possibility of a change in government is a constitutional principle of the modern Russian constitution. Navalny was arrested in January when he returned from Germany 
where he spent five months recovering from poisoning, an accusation that Russian officials reject. In February, Navalny was given a two and a half year prison term for violating the terms of a suspended sentence from a 2014 embezzlement conviction that he dismissed as politically motivated. Hermione G, Euronews. So to come on Euronews now, sound tests on whales have been approved in Norway. The plan is to see how they respond to man-made ocean noise, but animal rights activists say the experiment could be detrimental to both the whales and humans. We'll have the full story after the break. Let's see what we can build today. your city in Forger Empires for free in the App Store and at foe.tv. The Ontario Women's Hockey Association permanently suspended Felton with no chance of reading the statement for 15 years. But despite that ban, Feldman is still coaching. He moved the team down to Florida, posts on social media show him on the ice. A lawyer for Feldman tells CBC News that the allegations are false, but wouldn't comment on the recording. The OWHA and Hockey Canada say they have no jurisdiction over private hockey programs on either side of the border. There's no mechanism to, to enforce any type of regulation of what he does in his own business. Leaving the parents and players who spoke out wondering how a lifetime suspension didn't even last a season. Jonathan Gayhouse, CBC News, Toronto. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us. I just want to explain to people, because the space here is so tight and we can't socially distance, that, that's why we have to wear the masks. But we have to be together because this is a conversation we have to have. Jeff, you know, you wrote some pretty startling words about your experience door knocking in 2014. Can you give us a sense of, of what you saw, what you experienced then? Well, it became evident when uh, when I first started canvassing that I had a very different experience from the uh, the candidate in the election prior to me, and it was unique because Ali Chabar had run in an election ten months prior to me because it was a by-election, so it was still fresh in the minds of everyone at the doors that Ali had knocked on the doors. And very early on, when I would knock on the doors, I would get a lot of comments like, "Oh boy, this is a surprise. We're excited to see you knocking on your door." And, and uh, Jeff, I remember people saying, "Oh, Jeff Bennett, that sounds like a great English name," and, and just. Those, those sorts of comments, and, and the first couple, you're like, I, you know, that, that, that must be a once-off, but it, it happened enough over the span of the campaign that I came to realize that Ali's experience running in London West was, was very different from mine. Don't look them as that's very much triggers, though. So I, I know you've got that post, mm -hmm. and I wonder, when you read it and when you listen to what Jeff's saying, how recognizable is that language to me? So, I mean, first of all, I think I could commend Jeff for having courage to stand up, and that's what every Canadian came to, to stand up and confront racism and Islamophobia when they see it as they see it. In terms of how recognizable this is, this is this is what Canada has unfortunately become. It's not what any of us thought of, it's not what any of us think of Canada, but this is what unfortunately how things have become. This city, London, has seen Pegida marches regularly. Uh, other kinds of horrible, racist, white supremacist, Islamophobia cool things. It's not acceptable, it needs to stop. And it's, by the way, it's not just a London problem. Uh, this is a Toronto problem. This is a Montreal problem. This is a Quebec City problem. This is an Alberta problem. Canada problem. This is a Canada problem. So, Jeff, you know, it's, it's one thing to write that, but, but I think the question is sort of I have, and you probably have for yourself, is what did you do about it in the moment? What do you, what do you wish you had done? I wish I had spoke up more and used my, my voice uh, more to, to address this. And that's even why I wrote this this morning, because I think it's ridiculous that here we are in 2021, and this is still an issue that my friend Ali Chabar faces and that this entire community faces. And the rest, like people like me, who grew up in a much more privileged position, we, 
we've just become too accepting of it. And I hate that it takes something, we're being reactionary here. Like it takes a travesty for us to stand up and say, oh, something needs to change here. I was aware of this seven years ago. We were all aware of this five days ago. And yet it takes this for us to gather. I wish I had uh, spoke up more seven years ago. Yeah, approach. I think that's, that's definitely a huge part of it. But there's so much more that it's There's white supremacist groups that are actively militant. Over 250 of them. That's crazy. Uh, and it's something that has just become an accepted part of the Canadian spirit instead. You can have a group that calls itself the Clan, that calls itself the Soldiers of Odin, that calls itself the Three Percenters, and we're okay with them. Uh, that needs to change because it, for us, it's like a, you have to have people die for someone to save the word Islamophobia. That's not okay. It needs to change. Let's talk about that word because in that mosque are politicians. We know that, that 91 politicians a few years ago, Aaron O'Toole was one of them, did not, did not sign on to a motion condemning Islamophobia. What is, what is the net effect of that? I mean, I think, obviously, I, I will note that Aaron O'Toole has now utilized the word Islamophobia. So has Bob Shang, uh, who historically did not use the word Islamophobia. There was a unanimous consent motion in the House today about it. But at the end of the day, the stance then was totally inappropriate. Today, the barest acknowledgement of the fact that this is happening is like, yes, it's the bare minimum, but it needs to go so much further. Just like we're now in the position of having to thank people for saying that racism, that hate, that Islamophobia is a real thing. One last thought just before we began with you. Do you have any thoughts for most of the, for the people here, Jeff? I, all I can do is offer, offer apologies that more hasn't been done. And, and, and I, that's what he wrote in my post. I, I'm sorry that I haven't stood up more in the past, but all I can do is try and change that going forward. And I think we need more authenticity. We, we need to recognize that this is systemic racism. It's embedded on our society, and we need to uh, take steps every day. All of us need to look in the mirror and realize that we're a major part of it. Personal steps. Personal steps. Gentlemen, again, thank you very much for your time. Please tell me if I'm going. This gas station in northern Israel is at a junction between Arab and Jewish towns. Okay, what, uh, the protector of the Roth style. Tom may be the protector of the Roth child. The funny style that has cause passing here. Last month, chaos surrounded the old gas station Shoshi Stavis family has run for generations. Uh, and the new expansion they were getting set to open. May 12th, an angry mob of Jewish men, some tied to an extremist group of soccer fans, took over the intersection, looking for Palestinian Arabs. I just saw a lot of people, a lot of flags, bats, noise, shouting, firecrackers. Like, the town uh, focuses energy on the Jewish people of Saudi Arabia. I walked here and her son, Naman, texted his two Arab workers throughout the night as he used to watch. It was uh, naturally terrifying. Um, I was afraid uh, for myself. Um, I was afraid for the business. Uh, I was afraid for the people that I know. The crowd was on their doorstep. From the darkness of their hiding spot, Deep Jermaine was in disbelief. We said to each other, what do they want from us? Both of us have worked here for over 15 years, and everybody knows one another. Why us, of all people? 
It was the end of Ramadan, but instead of celebrating with their family, Jovan and Osman Shah huddled in fear for five harrowing hours. I had high blood pressure, racing heart, and was scared. I went into shock. The experience uniting them in a way they never imagined. <coughs> a dinner with community members of all faiths, Uri Yeremias' well-known fish restaurant was firebombed by an Arab mob. It's partly because they're Jewish and partly because I'm representing the coexistence. Yeah? So uh, both of them together makes me an enemy of the, of the radicals. Twenty guests and Arab staff, including a chef and sous chef, hid here until it was safe for them to escape. But despite what they went through, Yeremias decided he wouldn't be drawn ending spiral of retribution. I decided on the spot that I'm not going to be led by uh, anger or uh, revenge. As he begins to rebuild his restaurant, he says restoring and repairing the delicate balance between Arabs and Jews will be a long and grueling task. One uh, radical with a match in his hand can create a fire that a thousand brave fire brigade people cannot the Jews strongly oppose Back at the gas peace station, between the Arabs and the Jews. And are reminded every day how difficult it will be to restore that delicate balance. As we speak, a man on a motorcycle pulls up. The man swears at us as he walks by. Seems a little off. Palestinians could be the Israeli scapegoats the way the Japanese are the United States scapegoats. The last month has held up a mirror to Israeli society and all the cracks that come with it and can't be so easily fixed. Stephen Susan, CBC News, Jerusalem.
this country and that there are people who are willing to commit acts of violence against Muslims. And this is the latest tragedy. Um, we've had other attacks on Muslims in uh, Alberta. We've had uh, the killing of a last year of a, a volunteer in a mosque in Toronto. So we have to come to terms with this. Not only uh, the people in the Muslim community, we have to take action, but Canadians have to take action to decide what kind of nation they want. Do they want a nation that uh, you know gives people uh, motivation to do these types of violent acts? Or do we want a nation where we live together in uh, peace? Um, I, I'm just still reeling from hearing the news. So we heard there a 20-year-old man charged with both murder and manslaughter. Is there some relief in the way police have reacted in arresting this person uh, or this suspect uh, quite quickly in the aftermath and also in treating this as a hate-motivated crime? Often in these circumstances, we don't always see that language being used. You know, I suspect that you know they have some evidence that makes it easier for them to use that language. But, but what's your take on how police are dealing with this case? Well, I'm uh, I'm pleased to hear that the police are treating this as a possible hate crime. We're also pleased to hear that terrorism charges are being considered because whenever an act like this happens, and whoever it's targeted against, whether it's uh, Muslims, Jews, Blacks, or Indigenous people, it is an act of terror. People are terrorized. I'm sure that the Muslims across the country right now are feeling a sense of terror and a sense of foreboding. And, uh, you know, our, our parents might be, um, uh, you know, cautioning their kids to go out or preventing them from going out on walks because this happened when people were out for a walk. And, uh, you know, there was nothing, uh, they weren't doing anything dangerous. They were just minding their own business. And this man, decided that he was going to run his truck over them. Um, so the reaction of the police so far uh, I, you know, has been positive and, and I support it, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, hate crime and terrorism charges will be laid, unlike the case of uh, the killing in Quebec City. Yeah, you touched on something and I have to wonder if, if these are conversations that people are having. You know, I was just thinking back to the weekend when my family did exactly that. We went out for a walk after dinner, uh, my husband and my stepsons, and you know, we weren't thinking that we were in any kind of danger. Um, I'm visibly Muslim. Do you think that this is a conversation that people are having about uh, feeling unsafe? Uh, you know, the, the I believe it was the mayor of London did want to reassure people that uh, London was safe and that they were standing strong. So, how important is it to have that messaging from leaders? And, and how do you think Muslim families are feeling? Well, I think it's critical for uh, political leaders to come out and uh, stand in front of a camera and a microphone and send a message that not only is this unacceptable, but we need political leaders to do more than just issue words. We need actions. Um, the government committed some funds towards an anti-hate strategy, but we haven't seen uh, much leadership beyond giving money. The federal government needs to undertake a national anti-hate strategy that includes public education, that includes giving more powers to police to lay hate crime charges when such acts happen, and also to uh, change some laws federally um, to address issues of hate crime. With respect to Muslim families, I think that Muslim families, now that they've learned this news, are going to be having these conversations the same way they have had conversations every time um, a Muslim is attacked, and particularly um, families where, like yourself, where the woman is visibly Muslim who wears a hijab because uh, they're going to be very um, hesitant about going out about their business now that such an uh, act has happened again in Canada. You know, we've, had, we've seen some calls, as you talked about, for legislation around uh, uh, hate crimes. We've seen, you know, certain groups uh, designated as terror groups. Do you think that the steps that we've take, taken are in the right direction? Do you think that we, we're taking, um, you know, white supremacy and these hate groups as seriously as we could in Canada? While the action with regard to the uh, terrorism designation of some hate groups is positive, um, I think we haven't gone far enough. There are other hate groups out there with white supremacist attitudes, anti-Muslim, anti-black, anti-indigenous, anti-immigrant, and they need to be uh, brought under the umbrella of such designations. Um, in addition, uh, we made a series of 18 recommendations to the government when uh, committees were considering 
uh, the uh, Islamophobia uh, motion, M103, and uh, there need to be changes that happen in terms of how government, both federal and provincial, deal with such actions. Not only in terms of uh, what can be done legally, but also on the term, in terms of the education front. There needs to be a public education campaign. Immigrants make up more than a quarter of, uh, of Canadians, and if you uh, talk about the descendants of immigrants, that's even larger. Immigrants are critical to this country, and yet there are segments of this society which see people who are different, different skin color, different faith, as somehow being a threat, and yet we are all contributors to this society, and therefore, Canadians who want to live in a peaceful society need to put pressure on politicians to get their act together. All right, great comments with Canadians united against hate, offering his reaction this hour to news that a family of four, four members of the family, killed in a hit and run, police calling it hate motivated and targeted. She's selling for about 25,000. 25,000? Yeah. For this bank, people will pay that. Angel Pui is giving the lowdown on high-end designer handbags. Fashion houses like Hermes, Chanel, and Gucci make limited editions. Everyone is chasing after the same unicorn, as they call it. A handbag fan herself, she started a business last year selling some of those hot-ticket items for a profit. A buyer in Korea sent $1,600 for a Gucci bag using an electronic funds transfer from bank account to bank account. About a month later, Pee noticed the money was gone. I just didn't understand what was happening. I just felt this sense of shock. She called her online bank, Tangerine. Why didn't you can see where your money's going? But all they could tell her was a bank in Korea had requested a payment recall, and Tangerine allowed it. They should at least tell me about it, hear my side of the story. She emailed her buyer, got no reply, wrote her bank too, several times, no response. Payment reversals are a common problem, says this expert, and as more businesses move online in the pandemic, she says, the problem is growing. When you hit a brick wall and you don't even know why the money's been withdrawn again, that's incredibly frustrating. Transparency is something that's always desirable and it's just a part of good customer service. But it's all allowed, says the ombudsman. For instance, in cases of possible fraud or money laundering, thanks to the fine print in most bank account agreements. Usually they have language in them that gives the bank a lot of scope for how to handle these type of cases. Tangerine's terms say deposits or withdrawals from your account may be reversed and it may change the requirements for transferring funds at any time. After GoPublic got involved, Tangerine gave its customer her money back, but still wouldn't tell her or us what happened. Angel Pewey says she's learned an important lesson. Banks can reverse a deposit with no clear explanation. Why? Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. In Yamna Afzal's hands, the world was filled with so much promise. Her vision, excellence, integrity, respect, and honesty. I think about the four virtues that are listed on this wall. Remote learning and gaming all at the same time. Home is where your life happens. So get Verizon Fios, the 100% fiber optic network with plans starting at $39.99 per month. Plus, when you upgrade to our fastest speeds, get your next year of Amazon Prime and an Echo Dot on us. Only on Verizon. Graduated last year, she left behind a gift. She and her mother painted this mural. It is now her legacy. It means the world, and it really is telling of the fact that we lost uh, true gems of not just our school community, but the community at large. The community is crushed by the deaths of Yamna, her parents, and her grandmother. Her nine-year-old brother, the lone survivor, remains in hospital. The family's a very integral part. Uh, they're very active members of our community. Hassan Mustafa knows the family from the mosque. He is rocked by the revelation that police believe the family was targeted because of their faith. As a father, I feel it's my job to protect my family. As a community leader, I feel it's my job to protect my community. And so it's, it's tough. It's a tough day. It's a tough week. Tonight, at the site of the attack, people paid their respects. Honestly, I think we all feel some personal connection to this, whether or not we're from this faith, whether or not we know this family, we're all part of this community and we all care about them. To get here today, I walked. And a couple of
of times I stopped and waited for the light to turn green. And I never once thought about my personal safety. And everybody deserves that same right. From there to where a vigil was held, the hundreds in attendance listening for words of healing. We will not cower out of fear to this community, which has made London stronger for generations, and to all Muslim Canadians, we are with you. We have to commit ourselves to working across party lines, with premiers, with mayors, with faith leaders, to end the kind of violence and hatred that took these lives. Everyone hoping to one day see a world as beautiful as Yama Afso created. You know, you and I were watching this visual together and we went into the crowd and I'm wondering what, what you're taking away from that. I was amazed by how many people came out to be here today and it, it's people from, from London but I was also speaking to men who drove two hours to be here and has to be at work at six o'clock in the morning. He thought it was important to be here to show his support for the Muslim community here in London. And I, I was speaking with a number of, of people who said, you know, they, it, it's great to see this support, but this should have never happened. And it never should have gotten to this point. You came here very quickly after this happened. And then I know, you know, a lot of it rattles around in your head at night in a moment like this. And, and I'm wondering, what have, what have you learned in particular that that's not going to leave you? For me, it's, it's the emotional impact that this has had on everybody. Every conversation that I had, at some point, people would break down. If this hits home for this community, for the Muslim community and beyond. Everybody thinks about their own families and how they could have been there at that time as well. And it's, it's really not about a division. This should matter to everybody. Criminals using these devices believed they were secretly planning crimes far beneath the radar of law enforcement. But in reality, the criminals were not underneath the radar. They were on it. The FBI was monitoring those conversations. The very devices that the criminals used to hide their crimes were actually a beacon for law enforcement. The criminal users didn't know that for more than 18 months, the FBI captured more than 27 messages. 27 million messages between users around the world who had their criminal discussions reviewed, recorded, and translated by the FBI until the animal platform was taken down yesterday. One after the other, major websites went down across the globe. E-commerce giant Amazon was hit, along with social media companies, major news organizations, even the UK government. The culprit? a glitch at a tech company you probably haven't heard of. Welcome to Fastly, where we make websites, the Internet of Things, APIs, and mobile apps fast and secure. Fastly runs a cloud-based service that's used by major companies. It is essentially the middleman between the companies and the consumer to make the service faster. This morning, in a tweet, it blamed the outage on a network issue and was able to get things back online in about an hour. There are just a small number of companies that do this en masse and we rely on these companies. There are huge companies out there that, that will clearly rely on them to do one part of the delivery of the content. This cybersecurity expert says there have been similar issues with other cloud servers, but if this one lasted longer, it could have been a disaster. Every minute, companies would have been losing what, thousands, if not millions of pounds, especially the e-commerce site. And so yes, yeah, a very dangerous and worrying time for those who are in control of it. 
but there are also issues with public confidence and concerns about how a glitch at one company can have such a widespread impact. It explains the increasing distrust that we have in large organizations and government and experts and scientists because companies, people, consumers perceive these companies as having so much power and information and resources and they can't keep their own system operating. It's estimated the outage cost retailers nearly $2 billion. Analysts believe it's possible some of the big web companies could come after Fastly for compensation. Renee Polconi, CBC News, London. She's a human rights advocate and is in Ottawa tonight. Hi, Amira. Thanks for taking the time uh, to speak with us. And I, I, I want to go back because I understand that, you know, you worked with the National Council of Canadian Muslims during another tragedy, uh, and that was the Quebec mosque shooting. I have to wonder if you're experiencing deja vu today. Yes, uh, Janela, I mean, the emotions uh, are a roller coaster ride. Um, you know, I've gone through shaking, through uh, disbelief, through uh, just, you know, utter shock uh, and dismay, as many, many of your viewers will certainly feel, and certainly in the broader European you know, communities, uh, this is the feeling. Hate crimes and of this nature, you know, they're, they're message crimes. It's sending such a horrific message into our communities. And just like January 29th, when uh, the news of a massacre at Quebec City Mosque came to us, and we had to react to it, and just that, that fear uh, that is visceral, um, you know, the heart is just broken, thinking of the, the victims and their families and what they're going through, uh, being targeted in this way for no other reason than for being uh, of Muslim faith. Um, it is absolutely uh, shattering uh, to go through this again. Uh, we also went through it uh, in the Christchurch, uh, New Zealand attack a uh, few years after the city. Um, and so it's, it's really quite heartbreaking to continuously have to uh, go through and endure and imagine the families that have now to bury their loved ones. You know, through your work as a, as a human rights activist, both with NCCM and other groups, do you feel like government bodies and police officials um, have taken these types of acts seriously enough? I mean, we've seen at least in this situation that police are calling this hate-motivated. Uh, they are investigating uh, along that line. Do you feel uh, encouraged by the reaction from police in the aftermath? excellent question, Janela. I mean, for years and years, as hate crimes and hate incidents were on the rise, targeting various communities, including Canada's Muslim communities, we have been in dialogue with police services across the country to ask them to take these uh, reports seriously, that when someone calls to report any type of hate incident or hate crime, that those reports are taken seriously for a very long time during my work and the work of others. We actually saw almost a dismissal in times where people were told, well, there's nothing we can do about it, there's no report we can take. Um, even the Quebec City Mosque prior to the attack, uh, a pig's head was left with a very menacing message. That was not considered a hate crime. And so what we have seen time and time again is that police services um, have not necessarily always taken these types of crimes as seriously as necessary. So to hear uh, now that there is evidence that we have yet to see that this mass murder was motivated by hate uh, is very important that that comes up because rumors also tend to swirl and we do need our public authorities to tell us and provide us the information uh, because the fear, that vacuum that we all sort of exist in once something like this happens where we don't know what's going on is, is also very dangerous and very frightening. Is there anything that we can learn or take away from other tragic situations? I mean, you were in the middle of this unspeakable tragedy in grief in Quebec when these six men were gunned down, families had lost loved ones, and the community came together in mourning and in grief and had to figure out how to move forward. Is there, are there any lessons learned from that that you can share with the London community you know, the outpouring of love and support from fellow Canadians from coast to coast to coast 
is always what keeps us going through moments like this. Um, that solidarity, that allyship, you know, I've already been receiving calls uh, from folks right across Canada saying, you know, that they stand with our communities um, and that they will stand up to hate wherever they find it. So those messages are important. You asked earlier of uh, Imam uh, Munir about, you know, the role of elected officials. Their role is critical to send out a very strong message that hate against any community must be stood against. And then, of course, we have to think about the impact of online hate. And this is something that came out um, from Quebec City and from other tragedies like this, in which we have to question, you know, this perpetrator that is now accused of killing these four beautiful people, you know, was he exposed to the vitriol, the racist hatred that is unfortunately permeating our online spaces in which we're waiting for the federal government to take action on? So we really do have to look at this holistically. It is about community reaction and action, and proactivity, and it's also about our elected officials doing the right thing, taking responsibility of whatever environment and climate that we now find ourselves in, what are the mechanisms we can put into place to ensure people's safety and inclusion in our communities. Quarantine hotels are expensive and unpopular. 14 days of isolation and inconvenience. Soon, some Canadians could skip both. Travelers would have to be fully vaccinated 14 days or more prior to their arrival. And they will still be required to have a negative pre-departure PCR test result and required to be tested on upon arrival. People will still have to quarantine at home until they get their test result. If negative, the isolation ends immediately. The target is early July, but the timelines will be driven by the disease rather than the date, based on case counts and vaccination rates. Our border measures will take into account these kind of benchmarks, such as the 75 20, um, uh, and where we're at with that. The exemption will apply to Canadian citizens and permanent residents who are fully vaccinated with a Health Canada approved vaccine. So this would be uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Johnson & Johnson, um, Pfizer and Moderna. And uh, of course, we'll be assessing other vaccines as we move forward into other phases. So David, this is clearly, you know, it's a critical, but it's just one small step towards reopening, not the comprehensive plan some people are looking for. Yeah, the government's taking a pretty slow and cautious approach on this, largely, Adrian, because there's still a lot to figure out. Like, what constitutes proof of vaccination at the border? I mean, Ottawa and the provinces are working on vaccine passports, but that's not done yet. Then there's the vaccine story. It's good in Canada right now, especially on first doses, but only about 10% of Canadians are fully vaccinated. So there's still a long way to go on second doses to hit the key benchmarks that public health officials want to see. And so what about the provinces? How are they factoring into this? Yeah, there's a broad range of, of opinions at the provincial level in terms of how fast you move on the border. Some are keen on it, but then you've got like Ontario, it's running ads, it's writing letters, demanding tougher measures to deal with variants. So the consensus isn't there yet. There is an appetite for a clear step-by-step -step plan. Today, all they got was a baby step. All right, David Crawford in Ottawa. Thank you, David. Thank you. Flowers and skid marks stain the site of a deadly attack. Here is where police say a man motivated by hate ran down a Muslim family just out for a walk. Actually seeing that and hearing about it being right there is just, it's, it's awful. Paige Martin drove by the scene just after it happened. She saw people performing CPR trying to save lives. A 74-year-old woman died here. A man and woman in their 40s 15-year-old girl were rushed to hospital and died. The lone survivor in hospital with serious injuries tonight, a nine-year-old boy. I have nieces and nephews that are that age. Um, like, what, what are they gonna do? You know, it's one of those, like, why, why? They're just out for a walk. A family
family walk as was their habit, say those who know them. But last night, police say a man driving a pickup truck purposely jumped the curb and mowed the family down. We believe that this was an intentional act and that the victims of this horrific incident were targeted. We believe the victims were targeted because of their Islamic faith. Police arrested the suspect a short distance later. They say he was wearing a vest that looked like body armor. They wouldn't say why they believe hate was the motive, but that revelation has shaken the community, especially those who know the family. It was a beautiful family, uh, one of the nicest person I have ever known. If it, that is true, that's really evil, but I can't comprehend how can someone do that. This family friend recalls what happened when she heard the news. Very, very, very difficult. Everyone is screaming and crying. We leave our country to come to Canada to save, but we are not safe. We are not safe anymore. The mayor of London made it clear an attack on the city's Muslim community is an attack on all. This was an act of mass murder perpetrated against Muslims, against Londoners, and rooted in unspeakable hatred. And today, people try to fight that with love honoring the victims lost and the boy whose life is forever changed. So Dr. Let, let's talk about the little boy for a moment. What is your sense of what the community is trying to do for them? Well, we know that there's been an online campaign to raise funds for the boy that thousands of dollars have already been raised. And this community is going to continue to come together over the next few days. A, a vigil it has been planned for a, a mosque in the community. And of course, this memorial, I'm sure, will continue to grow. Mata, thank you very thank much. You. And along with the grief and anger, there is, of course, so much worry for that little boy. Earlier, I spoke with Abdel Fatah Tawakul, a former imam of the London Muslim Mosque. He knows the family and those who love them. Imam, thank you uh, for being with us tonight. And I, I think what so many people want to know right now, is there anything you can tell us about how the little boy is and, and what sort of support is there for him? So the boy had serious uh, injuries. Um, they're considered as non-life threatening. Um, so we believe that he will survive and get through this. Um, and he does have um, some uh, family supports um, here. Uh, and, and we will continue to offer uh, whatever that we can um, for, for the boy and, and for the uh, extended family uh, to get past uh, or to get through this tragedy. Well, I know you've been speaking with uh, people in the community all day, and, and I'm wondering, what is it overwhelmingly that you are hearing from them about how they're feeling right now? Right now, understandably, there are a lot of raw emotions. Um, we, we feel that th this was an attack on, on all of us, because this was something, it, it's, it's a hate-motivated murder. And, and this is something that, you know, as Canadians, we we think that you, this is something that is unfathomable, but we've already experienced, just within the Muslim community, three different incidences over the past few years. You know, in 2017, the Quebec Mosque Massacre, and then last year in 2020, the, uh, the, the brother who was killed at the IMO, and now four members of the same family that are, are, are killed out of hatred. And so this is something that we need to take a collective stand and to say that, that we will not accept any form of violence based on, on hatred or, or discrimination. And we really need to take concrete steps to stand collectively to say that, that we will not accept any of these actions, neither for ourselves within the Muslim community, nor for anyone uh, outside of the Muslim community. It's a collective stance that draws upon our common sense of, of humanity. You know, as we're standing here, people are bringing flowers. Uh, a number of people have said, what can they do to help? They know people are afraid within the community. So what, what can they do? What, what could you say to them to, to help them know what to do right now? So we acknowledge and, and validate you know, the, the fears. Um, members within the Muslim community, uh, we've received multiple messages to ask, is it safe for us to, to walk the streets? And we want to be able to provide a sense of, of reassurance that, you know, in general, our community is safe, but we need to take a stance that, that is, is collective. And so 
if you see or hear of any form of, of discrimination or hatred or racism or bigotry, then we have to call it out and stand against it unequivocally. Well, thank you very much. We're all thinking in your community right now. Thank you. To many, Braden Bushby has come to symbolize the tensions of the community and inadequacies of the justice system. Now, after years of delays, finally today, he walked into this courthouse to receive a sentence. Eight years minus one month in the death of Barbara Kenner. It feels like some sort of justice. Kenner's sister, Connie, pleased with the sentence and the judge's acknowledgement of targeting of Indigenous women. I think she did a pretty good job because she actually acknowledged what, what is really going on around here, not even around here, all over the place. In 2017, Barbara Kendner was walking with another sister. She was struck by this trailer hitch thrown from a passing vehicle. She died five months later. Bushby admitted he threw it. At trial, court heard he was out to, quote, yell at hookers. The case highlighted racial tensions in Thunder Bay and focused criticism on the justice system's handling of murdered and missing Indigenous women cases. Thunder Bay having to traditionally take a complaint seriously. Lawyer Krista Bigkanu is with Aboriginal Legal Services. We don't see a lot of cases uh, that are hate crimes, but maybe we need to start charging them. Compounding frustration, delays getting to trial, charges downgraded, tensions felt all around. This case and this uh, sentencing was never going to be a, a solution to um, the challenges and the racism that Indigenous people face in our community. Um, no individual case can do that. I received some death threats as a result of defending Mr. Bushby. Uh, I was called uh, a racist lawyer, that sort of thing. So will anything change? Kendra's cousin hopes so. I believe it sends a message to other people that, that uh, to think twice before they do something. For this case, it may not be the end. While Bushby is in custody, an appeal of his conviction is underway. Tamara McIntosh, CBC News. When it comes to questions about whether the two former federal scientists were spying for China, I'm not aware of what to mention. Today, a Chinese official deflected. China and Canada have some scientific cooperation, which is quite normal and should not be politicized. But it already is. We don't know why doctors Chu and Chang were fired. We don't know how a scientist from the People's Liberation Army gained access to the Winnipeg lab. In 2019, Jiango Chu, her biologist husband, Keating Chang, and her Chinese students were stripped of their security clearances and escorted from the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, just months after Chu sent a shipment of Ebola and Hennepa viruses to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Will he acknowledge espionage was involved in the Winnipeg lab incident? The Public Health Agency has agreed to give unredacted documents to the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, which has the highest security clearance. This work can be done without people. In 2018, Chu received a Governor General's Award for Innovation for her work on a treatment for Ebola. Some of that work was done with scientists affiliated with the Chinese military. This needs to be a wake-up call for Canada. It appears that you know what we might well call Chinese agents infiltrated um, one of the highest prized national security elements when it comes to biosecurity. This security expert agrees. Uh, if there's information that's going from us to a hostile uh, foreign state, that is something that has significant ramifications. Despite regular visits to their two Winnipeg homes, Chu and Chang have never been reached for comment. The two scientists remain under RCMP investigation. Their whereabouts are unknown. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Two weeks before this, Capitol Police Intelligence knew Trump supporters were planning to storm the Capitol with weapons, but they underestimated the threat and failed to pass it up or down the security chain. Clearly a failure of leadership. I want to be clear, the men and women of the Capitol Police that were out there defending the Capitol, the men and women who were in the Capitol, uh, did uh, heroic actions. Capitol officers were grossly ill-prepared. Only 10 were fully trained to use all the non-lethal munitions for riot control. 
and much of their equipment was defective or out of reach that day. This was like the Super Bowl of domestic terrorism, and there should have been planning ahead. The report also faults the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI, who alerted Capitol Police of potential, quote, war, only the night before and almost casually in an email. It was just amazing that that intelligence did not get in the right hand. Our country has had enough. But nowhere in the report is any critique of Donald Trump's rule. A credible report. Time to move on, according to Republican senators. Uh, Mr. Bannon who just 10 days ago blocked any independent commission into January 6th. But out of fear or fealty to Donald Trump, the Republican minority just prevented the American people from getting the full truth about January 6th. Today's report on the attack was the most extensive yet, but deliberately steered away from the contentious questions in order to get bipartisan support. Democrats have not backed off, but Republicans aren't budging either, saying the dozens of recommendations, plus federal charges against more than 500 people are enough. No need, said one Republican senator, for political voyeurism. Susan Holmston, CBC News, Washington. Not again. It's a heartbroken refrain because the news today is horrific and the latest in a painful loop of violence. I don't see why people can't just spread love and have to spread hate and why people can't just live their lives without having to face this sort of discrimination. At the end of the day, our hearts are broken. Our hearts are broken. Our minds are numb. Right? We are reminded of the, the worst kind of um, a, a situation that can happen to our community. A reminder of a recent history that is dark and ugly. From 2013 to 2019, the National Council of Canadian Muslims tracked more than 300 incidents targeting Muslims, including more than 30 acts of physical violence. The year 2017 stands out, 72 attacks that year alone. Worst among them, the bloodstained nightmare of the Quebec City mosque shootings. In a community still recovering from the murders of six men there, leaders say today's news pierced their hearts. It's good. Uh, so this news that I, I heard uh, this year. Labidi says what happened in his mosque could have been a lesson, should have been a message against hatred. And we should we should work together uh, that that to, uh, to, to fight uh, against racism and uh, hate crime. Calls condemning today's violence are mounting, and advocates say police calling the London attack a hate crime helps the fight against it. And we do need our public authorities to tell us and provide us the information uh, because the fear, that vacuum that we all sort of exist in once something like this happens where we don't know what's going on is, is also very dangerous and very frightening. As the shock settles, more questions. The hope is more answers will emerge. While in Toronto, the lights were dimmed to mark a dark day drawing to a close. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Four members of a family struck and killed last night. A 20-year-old man in custody facing murder and manslaughter charges in an act that police are calling premeditated and hate-motivated. A nine-year-old boy, the only survivor, in the hospital tonight. I want to bring in Dr. Munir al Qasim. He's the Imam of the Islamic Centre of Southwestern Ontario. He joins me now from London, Ontario. And Imam, I want to first uh, express my condolences because um, I understand that uh, you've been in touch with the family. What can you tell me about who they were and how they're being remembered? Well, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to get out some of the energy that uh, I have been gathering since uh, early this morning. Uh, you asked about the immediate family. Unfortunately, someone decided last night that 
uh, only a nine years old boy will stay alive, hopefully. Uh, now, I spoke with the uncle of the mother who is, uh, you know, devastated obviously by what happened and uh, they asked for their privacy to be respected uh, and, uh, you know, the first thing that he said, he said, please send the message that uh, members of the community will not react in uh, an angry fashion and that we will uh, show, uh, you know, love, uh, we will uh, rise above retribution, uh, we will not engage in back and forth uh, uh, manifestation of anger. So this is something that really assured me that together we will be able to handle the situation uh, that is extremely tragic. I can't find words to describe it uh, in a way that is number one, pleasing to God, and number two, uh, uh, responsible enough for the rest of the community. You know, obviously, so much grief, I'm sure, uh, in London tonight, in, in the Muslim community and beyond. I have to wonder if there's also fear. Um, about uh, you know feeling like this family who was out going for a walk after dinner um, and was targeted specifically for their faith, as police have said, um, is there fear in the community this evening as you're hearing this news? Absolutely, you coined you know the the uh, feeling you know fear is widespread and it is quite justifiable. I have to tell you yesterday uh, when it happened, I was sitting with my small family. Uh, uh, you know, on the porch of our house, and I kept hearing the sirens back and forth. I didn't know what's happening. You know, everybody was enjoying a nice, breezy uh, uh, evening in London, Ontario, and someone uh, decided not to let four members of the family return home after such a stroll on peaceful London, on beautiful London. Now, uh, since this morning, you know, I could take some, but many other phone calls are waiting to be answered. The people are expressing fear, especially women who obviously are quite visible. Uh, uh, they are saying, uh, we are afraid to go out. We are afraid to uh, uh, go and engage in uh, routine daily activities. And this is not right. We have to do something to uh, uh, you know, calm down this fear, and and uh, you know, until when are we going to allow dates of the calendar to be engraved in our uh, uh, subconsciousness? You know, whether it is uh, uh, attacks against women in Alberta, whether it is Quebec City, whether it is the IMO in Rexdale, whether it is London, Ontario. You know, we will definitely uh, remember this date, uh, uh, you know, but it's not only remembrance, we've got to do something. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, glad to hear what uh, uh, your guest before me mentioned about the need for action not to make statements by politicians. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious also, you know, we just heard from the mayor here before we came to you, uh, what it means to hear from a leader of the city like that, talking about, um, you know, the, the, the fact that Muslims are a part of the community, that they are valued, calling this a, a mass murder and an act of hate. How important is it and meaningful is it to hear leaders speak in that way? I have to say that our mayor in London is extremely close to our community. There isn't an event where he is not with us and we communicate quite openly about things and I think he described it as it is. It's a mass murder. It's an act of terrorism. It's an act that should be called for what it is and, and we've got to uh, uh, deal with hatred uh, on the educational front, on the political front, on the social front, we've got to prevent this from ever happening again. So uh, we do appreciate what the mayor is doing and we know that he really meant every word he said. And we also have close relationship with our uh, police services uh, in London. See, I served for seven years as a Muslim chaplain with the London Police Services Board 
and we work very closely. You know, the community is growing, but one act like this will dampen the spirit of an entire community. And by the way, London, Ontario, for people who don't know, uh, has one of the largest Muslim populations per capita, perhaps in North America after Dearborn. Uh, so we are quite visible as a community and we have people engaged in different aspects in serving this community. So we don't want people to be alienated and, and live in fear and, uh, you know, already I had my daughter saying that we are afraid to take, you know, my grandchildren for a stroll in the park. That makes me, uh, uh, you know, worried about their fear. I don't want them. You know, I chose Canada. 46 years ago to be home for me and for my family and all of those who will be proud Canadians. So we've got to do something to stop this wave of hatred that is spreading all over the world. This is Canada and we want to keep it a peaceful and loving country for our children. Well, I want to ask you one more quick question before we go. As a man of faith, I assume you'll be praying for this family uh, tonight. We understand uh, an elderly woman, uh, two adults, and a teenage girl uh, have died, and a young boy in hospital tonight, the only survivor. Um, what words of comfort do you have as, as a man of faith for the community who is mourning this family tonight and the young boy who's lost his entire family? Okay, I can share with you the uh, video clip message uh, that uh, three other imams from London and myself quickly put together to comfort the entire community. And basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, we had to resort to our uh, uh, Quran, to the final scripture, where the Almighty tells us that during this life we will be subjected to many trials and tribulations. And we've got to put things in the proper perspective. Death is a fact we cannot escape. And people have to exit this life and continue their journey towards God. So, but we have to be brave, we have to persevere because God gave us the prescription of patience in faith of such tragedies. And also there is a message from chapter 36 of Quran which really says, do not follow an evil act with an act similar to it, but rather you know, follow that with something good so that it will uh, eliminate it. So this was the message to the community that we shouldn't let our anger be translated into negative energy. We should be able to control it. It's okay to grieve and we have to grieve. And I have to tell you, I cried and many other members of the community, leaders who were present this morning with the police and with the mayor, many of them cried because this is not something easy that we can take and you know just to start tomorrow another day. So my message is we've got to you know bring our Islamic values, our Canadian values, put them into action and make sure that everybody is not reacting in a negative way, but rather, you know, to use this as an opportunity to work together to affect a real change that probably through the passing of these four individuals, we will be able to solve a major global problem. Dr. Munir al qasim is the Imam of the Islamic Center of Southwestern Ontario. Thanks so much for your words tonight and our condolences to your community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fatima Ahmed and her father attended prayers today with heavy hearts. Ahmed is no stranger to anti-Muslim violence. She's been assaulted by people trying to tear off her niqab three times. If I go to the metro, I'll be standing next to the wall because I know that if I stand next to the line where the metro is coming, someone might push me. And a lot of these incidents happen in the metro, so I look around, I have my phone with me. In Edmonton, the community has been on edge in recent months after a series of attacks on five black Muslim women, including one incident outside a mall where a woman says her attacker ripped off her hijab and shouted racist slurs at her. Police have laid charges in the incidents ranging from uttering threats to assault. We're, we're having to teach our daughters and our children to be vigilant. In response to the attacks, the Al Rashid Mosque started offering self-defense classes for women that will resume after COVID restrictions lift. 
Still, Muslim leaders are having difficult conversations with young girls who are afraid to express their faith. We no longer want to wear hijab. We're too afraid to wear it. What if something happens when I'm walking to school? What if you're not there to protect me? That is heartbreaking to see how this is affecting young girls. This is affecting our future generation. Today, an emotional condemnation of anti-Muslim violence from Calgary's mayor. Let's not say that was isolated. That was a bad person. Let's understand that when people of color raise these concerns, let's not say you're oversensitive. The National Council of Canadian Muslims says from 2013 to 2019, there were more than 300 Islamophobic incidents around the country, including more than 30 acts of physical violence. Alison Dempster, CBC News, Edmonton. Begging for vaccines in Caracas with no idea of who was listening. Family members collecting the dead themselves with no idea of who's actually counting those lots. Infectious diseases specialist Dr. Julio Castro says his fellow Venezuelans feel alone now, unable to trust either the numbers or the clock. So we are doing a kind of unofficial surveillance system which taking count 20, uh, 40 of the bigger hospitals in Venezuela and the numbers are quite different from the from the official numbers. Help is not coming fast. Venezuela rejected offers of AstraZeneca vaccines from COVAX. It may get some mRNA vaccines from the group in July. The United States has excluded Venezuela from its vaccination donations for now, citing a lack of transparency about how the country has handled COVID. And deals made with Russian and Chinese firms haven't seen promised deliveries arrive in sufficient numbers. The black market, though, is surging for those with needs, paying up to hundreds of dollars for a shot. This is irregular, this is unethical, and this is dangerous for people. And Dr. Castro worries the once wealthy nation is now so mismanaged it has no resilience to handle either the illness or more economic collapse. Humanitarian crisis is the worst case scenario for Venezuela. And we, we, we are in the middle of that. Doctors live in the country. This is where COVID's global complications get uglier. For the first year of the pandemic, it was a problem for wealthier countries, perhaps because they tend to have older populations. But something happened a few weeks ago in May. On a single day, the pandemic flipped. With vaccines available for the rich, the death rates in higher and middle income countries dropped below those in lower income countries for the very first time. The poorest nations with the youngest populations of weakest infrastructure now see the most death and illness. COVID has officially turned its sights on the global poor. Mark that day on the calendar is the one Achal Prabhala, Bangalore, India, really started to happen. And I find that this is more terrifying in a way because what it means is uh, when poor countries are left to themselves for a disease that primarily affects them, it will mean that they will be worse off and have less resources uh, to deal with that. He's a global campaigner for access to medicine and says as wealthy countries see their dangers diminish and plan reopening, they forget the promise of we're all in this together. India didn't see huge loss until a few months ago. Now, nearly 350,000 are dead and the healthcare system is in crisis. Okay. The day our cameras were there, Prabhala was supposed to get his second shot, but the clinic ran out. And there's the enormous ironic problem. The country that's the world's largest vaccine manufacturer is short on vaccines. Barely 3% of its 1.3 billion people have been inoculated. But why do we have a vaccine shortage? The Indian government did really nothing to prepare itself for the pandemic. Uh, when the first phase of the pandemic passed, they invested nothing for the bulk of the year of the pandemic in any vaccine development efforts in this country. India's Serum Institute did have COVAX contracts to supply 92 of the world's poorest countries with vaccines, enough for 4 million people relying on that help. Deliveries were slow at first, then once the virus started wreaking havoc in India, deliveries stopped totally. And given that these vaccines were being made in our borders, the government had the authority to restrict those exports. 
countries that are waiting for vaccines from India, vaccines that are now not coming, what are they going to do? Well, they have decided that they cannot rely on the COVAX facility, which is what promised them uh, these vaccines. So it's failed dismally. And so what they did is to prepare themselves by buying vaccines on their own. One of the problems is that any any country that woke up late to understanding that it needs a, a large supply of vaccines is now at the back of the queue. Some of those countries now trying to make deals for vaccines when they don't have the means to pay for them, like Nigeria. Of its 200 million people, less than 1% are vaccinated. It has among the fewest doctors per capita in the developing world. And so little testing, it looks like there's very little COVID, but the virus shows its cruelties. Nafisada Damu used to work in a bank, but lost her job. So did a third of the country. Global COVID lockdowns and low oil prices demolishing the economy. I don't, need, I don't get help from any government. I don't get help, I don't get help from anybody. I am on my own. No jobs and a creeping sense of feeling unsafe. Surging violence in Nigeria, a side effect of being an unvaccinated and fragile country. There are kidnapping, more kidnapping, more robbery, more killing, more bandit, more boko, a lot of things. The only trigger that we know right now that, that has led to this is this gross economic you know, recession that we've experienced. So the sooner we get this pandemic over, the better for the whole world. Edwin Akuria is the Africa director for the One Campaign, a global effort to end poverty. As shocked as he is by what's happening in Nigeria, he's baffled by this country. Look at the number of vaccines per capita each nation has secured. The one that secured more doses per person than any other country in the world is Canada. And it is already vaccinating children. From the outside, this looks dangerously selfish. It may be great for the political landscape. But while you are vaccinating children over the age of 12, just remember that health workers in some low-income country who are also facing this virus every day do not have access to a vaccine. Remember that as long as the virus remains with them, remains in those places, it continues to mutate, it will come back to your own population in the, in the, in the, in the long run, and that every effort you've made before will be wasted. And if the medical humanitarian argument does not inspire sharing vaccines immediately, maybe an economic one. Once the virus is ravaging in other places of the earth, everything that Canada needs from those places or that's supposed to be selling to those places will not be there, right? The bulk of the world always feared they'd be left behind, and now they see it happening. See politics at play, not cooperation. In the very moment. Sharing matters most. live at our Tokyo shot this morning at 7.40 at night. Tokyo Bay there and the city all lit up and set to receive the athletes, the support staff in under 50 days for the Olympic Games. The International Olympic Committee holding its final executive board meeting before leaving for the Olympics. There continues to be momentum and a belief that they are pushing ahead to hosting them, but there continue to be safety concerns. Tokyo and a number of other prefectures still in the state of emergency <coughs> will be till the, day, till the end of June. There is a fourth wave of COVID cases. Numbers are high. Vaccination is low, less than 5% of the Japanese population. This morning, a top virologist in the country spoke out saying it is 100% impossible to have a zero risk games. And that's having an impact on people set to work on those games. The volunteers who are key 
On Japanese broadcaster today, word that 3,500 volunteers have quit. These are volunteers specifically who have roles in the city, helping people with transportation, for example. And that's in addition to 10,000 volunteers who've also dropped out, volunteers who were supposed to have roles specifically at Olympic venues, which got us wondering about what is happening within that volunteer core. They are such an important part of the hosting of any Olympic Games. And so this morning, we meet Barbara Haltus, who is a volunteer. She is in uh, Hamburg, Germany, going to be back in Tokyo. There's a reason that she is there, but normally in Tokyo. And Barbara, welcome to our program and to, uh, to Canadians as we introduce you this morning. Nice to meet you. I have a picture of you, Barbara, already in your Olympic volunteer uniform. Let's look at that together. So you already have it. You've already been uh, had that distributed to you. Do you know what your specific role will be or where you'll be working? Yeah, I'll be at the Olympics as well as the Paralympics. So at the Olympics, I'm in event services at the Ariake Stadium for tennis. And uh, so anything to do with spectators. And uh, for the Paralympics, I'm part of the protocol team and uh, supposedly working in the lounges for the IOC family. Okay, so lots of interactions with people in your role, one of thousands of roles for volunteers. What kind of protections have you been given? Saw you in a mask there. Yes, exactly. Well, that was added to our uniforms. So we were given two cloth masks. They told us also we're going to get a little bottle of hand sanitizer that was not yet distributed. I guess we get that on the, at the venues, as well as this little PDF booklet that we were supposed to print out, uh, in which we write in for 14 days before we started our uh, shift, uh, our measure our temperatures and write down any symptoms that we might have. And what about vaccine for you as a volunteer? No word on that, no testing at all, no vaccines. So a couple of masks, a tiny bottle of sanitizer, a record for you to keep, I mean, and no vaccination. How do you feel about the level of protection you're being given? Oh, it's absolutely uh, insufficient. Uh, I mean, we know that there's not going to be 100% safety at all from the virus, no matter, it can't escape testing, it can't even escape um, vaccines, but still that would be an added level of protection. Uh, but the volunteers, that large group is completely forgotten as well as local staff. Think of all the drivers that drive athletes to and from venues. Um, those are not being talked about. So is that why I mentioned those huge numbers, 3,500 we're hearing today in the city, 10,000 from the volunteer corps at the venues having quit already. Is that what you think has driven them not to show up? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, in addition to, of course, the sexist remarks that were in February um, when the uh, Tokyo Olympic chief, uh, Mori, eventually had to quit from that, so a thousand volunteers quit uh, in response to that. Um, but yeah, it, this is, the, I think, the largest part, but also because volunteers are not just concerned for their own safety, but also for uh, the danger of bringing the virus into their community. Now, for you, you're in, in Germany for family reasons, but do plan to be back in time, in time for Tokyo, and you've decided to go ahead at this point and to, to work as a volunteer. Why, then, given all of the things you just said to me? Well, uh, I mean, I joined for personal reasons, because I'm interested in it, as well as for professional reasons. I'm a sociologist, I wrote, uh, published a book on the Olympics, and that's my research. Um, but I do have to say I want to see first the training at the venues, uh, which is going to be in late June and July. And if I still deem that to be too dangerous for me, I still hold me that option that I will be quitting last minute, uh, as well as I think several other volunteers do. That's interesting. So that is a resort still for you, perhaps, depending on what you see. I mean, we still don't even know if there are going to be Japanese spectators allowed in those venues. They'll be deciding that at some point this month. 
I'm wondering too, Barbara, you can give us a read on this perhaps, although you're out of the country now, but we keep hearing about public sentiment and I'm wondering what level of support you detect in the community for these games. We've been hearing polling the Japanese don't want them, want them cancelled, but it seems what I'm reading of late is there is a growing acceptance of these games and an acceptance that they will go ahead. What is your latest thinking? Well, opinion polls just a few weeks ago told us about 80% of the Japanese population are either for cancellation or postponement. Uh, now, the newest poll is from Yomiuri Shimbun, uh, which is a very um, pro-Olympic uh, newspaper. So I'm not 100% sure if I fully trust that change in sentiment. But they're saying because of the now more faster rollout of the vaccines, that sentiment might shift. I am not quite sure, and I look out for more surveys to come in the near future. Well, Barbara, we'll stay in touch with you. Listen, when you're there in Hamburg, are you going to be able to get vaccinated yourself there, do you think? Yeah, it was a very rash decision because of a family emergency. But now, since I'm here, it's, I'm much more likely to get a vaccine here, so I'm trying. That might give you some level of protection that you don't seem to be afforded there. So interesting. Barbara, thank you very much for giving us the volunteer perspective. And as I say, we'll keep in touch with you heading up to Tokyo 2020. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. The, um, the certain main characters of the G7 conference with uh, Boris Johnson on the left. To the right, on the right left. Yeah, yeah. the far left, yeah. And um, so, um, you know, those are the things to make them, you know, to sort of say, you know, you've got to work together on this one. Um, got to uh, build it into uh, the way we do things, that we can recycle things, that we can repair things, and we don't just waste things. John and I worked together for over 30 years, making sculptures and waste square metal, things we can throw away. And this is just the perfect opportunity, and it's the perfect place as well, to um, just show it in the face. <laughs> you know, the world readers, you know, need to get their act together, you know, we all do, it's, you know, so that's pretty much why, as you said, why not? Police say the London attack was motivated by hate. Now the hunt is on to find out where the hatred came from. There is probably uh, an element of online uh, incitation to violence or, or right. access to things that we have to think about. Human rights advocate Amira al Gawabi spent more than a year examining online hate for a report. She says Canada's regulations are failing, and despite what the <coughs> calls for action, the <coughs> bill in the works is yet to be <coughs> It's really unfortunate that the real work that would make substantial change in the lives of people, not only Canadian Muslims, but other racialized groups that are targeted online, that type of change has not yet happened, and that really is a shame for us as, as Canadians. She said there have already been <coughs> two other deadly wake-up calls. In 2017, an attack where opened fire in a Quebec City mosque. An investigation revealed the gunman was radicalized online, consumed by far-right media. Two years later, a far-right extremist in New Zealand live-streamed his attacks on two mosques that killed 51 people.
Mm-hmm. <laughs> 